You're watching NASA TV. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us live here at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'm Leah Cheshire, and we're here today to discuss this Friday's upcoming spacewalk. This will be the eighth spacewalk for NASA astronaut Steve Bowen. He will be EV-1, and the first spacewalk for UAE, or United Arab Emirates, astronaut Sultan al Nayadi. He will serve as EV-2, and it'll also be the first spacewalk for a United Arab Emirates astronaut. These two astronauts will continue installation of hardware to support future power system upgrades. Here to discuss the space station and the tasks this week are Dina Contella, Operations and Integration Manager for the International Space Station Program, Scott Stover, the Spacewalk Flight Director, and Sandy Fletcher, the Spacewalk Officer. Later in the event, we'll move into the Q&A portion. If you have a question and you're on the phone line, please raise your hand by pressing star one. But before we get to that, I will turn it over to our briefers, starting with Dina Cantella. All right, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, so very excited about the spacewalk. It's happening Friday, and the crew will be um, turning on their, their or turning their suits to battery power around 8.15 a.m. Houston time, so start of the EVA around then, and then shortly after the crew will egress. Um, so uh, as uh, Leah mentioned, we're super excited about our crew. Uh, Steve Bowen, extreme veteran of spacewalks. Uh, this will be his eighth. Uh, and also Sultan Anayadi, um, excited about his first EVA and also the first for United Arab Emirates in general. So. Um, the, the, road, the crew's been on the, sort of the road to EVA the past week um, and, and working on it again this week. Uh, when they go out, uh, Steve will be wearing uh, the, the suit with the red stripes and as his designator for EV-1, and uh, Sultan will be wearing essentially an unmarked suit, so all white. Um, they um, are, I guess I'd say, um, that we're we're super excited about having them go EVA on this particular day, and they're mostly concerning themselves with preparing the uh, the station for the eventual uh, ISS rollout solar array installation EVAs. Those are happening in June, and also working on some comm equipment to retrieve that. So, just in general for the for the rollout solar array tasks, uh, those activities that and these guys will go into the details a little bit more, but. Uh, we're, we're trying to get all the cables ready and trying to, to pat down some uh, insulation that's uh, not exactly in the right configuration the way we want it. Um, and just generally pre uh, preparing things like uh, equipment and staging equipment so that's right in the perfect location so that the June spacewalks can go off as planned. And then when it comes to the comm equipment, the um, name of the comm equipment that we're retrieving um, is called the S-band, uh, well, it's RFG, which is um, the radio frequency group, so I lost my train of thought, um, but it's attached to an antenna, a high gain antenna, so it's a really large uh, item, and then the crew is going to be bringing that into the airlock for refurbishment. Um, eventually that'll come down and it will refurbish it on the ground and refly it so that it'll be a critical spare for, for some of our critical systems in the future. So that's the overview of the EVA. I just wanted to put a little context around the EVA because these guys will go into the, the, de the details, but um, so I'll just say that, that Steve and um, Sultan, they arrived on the Crew-6 vehicle, and that uh, docked in early March. Uh, and right away, uh, well, they were with, um, with Woody and Andre, and of course met up with the guys that are uh, in the Soyuz, which are Dimitri, Sergei, and Frank, and so that's the seven crew that are on board currently. And the Crew-5 guys came home, and then uh, SpaceX-27 flew, and that mission was uh, full of science, and we uh, deployed some exterior science, and we worked on some internal science. Examples of some of the internal science included um, some exciting research on heart cells and microorganisms and bacteria, um, lots, of, uh, lots of science, and that mission undocked around mid-April and um, splashed down successfully, so highly successful. Um, and then, um, you know, basically we've had NG-18 um, that's been docked to ISS for quite some time, but last week we finished filling it full of trash and we released that on Friday. Uh, as part of its mission, it also did a successful reboost of the ISS as well, so a uh, highly successful mission, and it, it has since uh, burned up as was per the plan. So uh, we also relocated the 69S Soyuz, and so our Russian colleagues moved that Soyuz from the Zenith 
from a zenith port to a nadir port and that really just set up for better eva planning uh, logistically and then um, i'll say looking ahead we also have another relocation of a crew vehicle and that's for the crew six vehicle we're going to move that from the a zenith port also to a forward port and that's because we're making way for the spacex 28 mission which will launch on june 3rd and it will dock to the zenith uh, it, it contains those ISS rollout solar arrays and the reach with the Canadian arm to get into that trunk um, is best from the Zenith location. So we really need to have that uh, on the Zenith. Uh, then as I mentioned, June, June 3rd is the SpaceX 28 launch. Um, it has the rollout solar arrays and also will have some science and we're looking at the mission length right now uh, for that particular mission. And uh, we're also trying to um, to determine the best launch date right now for the Axia mission. It's a private astronaut mission. So uh, we're, we're currently just looking at uh, what our options are. And then uh, for the Northrop Grumman 19 mission, we're expecting that sometime this summer. And then additionally, we have the Boeing crew flight test mission, which is at the end of July, July 21st. So we have a really busy schedule. And that's, so that's the context around the CVA. Uh, if I could just talk a little bit about EVA specifically, uh, in addition to visiting vehicles, we have the EVA this Friday, and then we also have, um, we've got a, a Russian EVA on or about May 3rd and May 12th. Uh, that is a slip to the schedule um, based on the necessity for the Russian crew to uh, basically look, look at in more detail at the tasks or have more time for task preparation. And then um, we have two more Russian EVAs over the summer in addition to the two ISS rollout solar array EVAs that we have in June. So that's our overall flight schedule um, in context, but uh, I know that's not what we're here to talk about, so I might have overstayed my welcome. <laughs> and at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, the lead EVA flight director um, for this upcoming EVA on Friday, Scott Stover. Thanks, Dina. So I'm Scott Stover, the lead flight director for the EVA on Friday. Uh, I first want to talk a little bit more about our crew members. Uh, our lead spacewalker is Steve Bowen. Uh, this will be his eighth EVA, so he's quite experienced. His seven previous EVAs all happened on shuttle missions uh, spanning from 2008 to 2011. Uh, we're very excited to have such an experienced crew member go out as our lead spacewalker. Our second spacewalker is Sultan. Um, this being his first flight, it'll be his first spacewalk as well. Uh, but as Dina said, we're very excited for Sultan and our Emirati friends, uh, giving them this opportunity uh, for a great experience. Uh, moving inside the vehicle, uh, Woody Holberg, uh, flight engineer, will be our suit IV, or the person that helps uh, both Steve and Sultan get suited up in the morning and then help them uh, doff their suits at the end of the day. Uh, and then Frank Rubio will be our M1, or our mobile servicing system operator number one. Uh, he is responsible for controlling the Canada Arm robotic arm uh, in moving uh, Steve around. You actually see that in the video that Sandy's going to show you, uh, that Steve will be on the end of the arm and uh, Frank will be the one controlling the arm to get Steve in the right positions. A little bit about our tasks. Uh, Dina mentioned, um, you know, the ISS is in the process of upgrading its power channels with new solar arrays. Uh, specifically, uh, the channel 1A and 1B both have already installed modification kits or support structure for these new solar arrays. Um, and what we really want to do on this EVA is prepare for the upcoming summer EVAs that will install those new solar arrays. Um, what we will do specifically is route some power cables uh, and then we will sort of tidy up some insulation that's on those modification structures. Uh, just making sure that uh, no um, bare metal is being shown or anything and everything's in a good configuration. And then finally, we'll move some uh, foot restraints around that will be used on those future spacewalks. The second major task, as Dina mentioned, is bringing in that radio frequency group, or RFG, inside the space station. Um, the program has asked us to bring that one home so it can be refurbished, and the only way to do that is through a SpaceX Cargo Dragon. So this needs to be brought from the outside inside the space station to be stowed on that Cargo Dragon. The, the interesting thing is this specific part of the box uh, was never designed to be handled via spacewalks. It was originally meant to be handled via the robotic arm. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions about uh, you know, backup plans. What if we have problems with bolts? How do we handle it since it wasn't really designed for that? Uh, and it wasn't meant to come inside in, in any way, shape, or form. So uh, you might hear us talking about what we need to do just to protect that uh, box as it comes inside the airlock. But that, those two major things are, are what we're trying to accomplish uh, this week uh, with the EVA. And with that, for more details, I'll hand <laughs> it over to Sandy, our lead spacewalking flight controller. Great. 
Thanks, Scott, and uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm very excited for this opportunity. Uh, I've also got a fantastic team backing me up, so I do want to at least mention their names. So on the task side, that helps us develop the task and how we do them. It's Greer Wilt, Tanner Burns, and Jenna Hansen. On the EMU suit side, as we call it, uh, that will be Nicholas McHugh and David Simon. Uh, we, I do want to also recognize it was a huge team effort, not just the, the small group that I just mentioned, but uh, you know there is an army of people that go through the hardware owners, the engineers, uh, the robotics people. Uh, lots of people work together to uh, get this EVA ready, and uh, I believe we're in great shape for executing it on Friday. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to an animation that our virtual reality laboratory puts together for us and uh, we can roll the footage. This video is for the S-Band Radio Frequency Group Retrieve EVA. EV1 with red stripes egresses and pre-positions two crew lock bags on the airlock toolbox. EV1 receives a large cable bag and puts it on his body restraint tether. EV2 with white stripes egresses with a crew lock bag, closes the thermal cover. EV1 translates up the forward face of the truss and goes starboard. He stops to configure both his and EV2 safety tethers. EV2 goes to the external stowage platform 2 and stows his toolbox for use later. EV1 stows the large cable bag at the S6 integrated electronics assembly. EV2 goes to the port crew equipment translation aid cart and retrieves an articulating portable foot restraint. Then he follows a similar path out to the S6 location to install that foot restraint also to be used on a future EVA. After EV1 stows the large cable bag, he goes to the starboard crew equipment translation aid and picks up a second foot restraint. EV1 returns to the S6 segment and stows the foot restraint at the outboard end of the integrated electronics assembly. Next, both EV1 and EV2 route cables on either side of the ISS power augmentation modification kit installed on the One Bravo Beta Gimbal assembly. They also adjust beta cloth on the modification kit to preclude thermal stresses on the metal structure. Once EV1 and EV2 finish at the 1 Bravo worksite, they will translate port to the 1 Alpha beta gimbal assembly to adjust the beta cloth on that modification kit. That concludes the activities and preparation for a future ISS rollout solar array installation EVAs later this year. EP2 returns to the external stowage platform 2 to the radio frequency group retrieve worksite. The hardware has a multi thermal installation tent over it. So EV2 will cut the clamshell portion off so it will remain installed on the high gain antenna. Next, EV2 will release several fasteners so the tent can be pulled back out of the way. He disconnects two NASA 
gravity lever electrical connectors and installs protective caps. Meanwhile, EV-1 retrieves another portable foot restraint from the Port Crew Equipment Translation Aid Cart. He brings it to the external stowage platform too and installs it onto the robotic arm. The robotic arm takes EV-1 to the bolt side of the radio frequency group and stanchion. Using the pistol grip tool, he releases nine bolts and then pulls the radio frequency group hardware off of the stanchion. EV2 returns to the airlock, opening the thermal cover while EV1 is flown over to meet him. The crew work together to stow the radio frequency group hardware safely in the crew lock. Then EV-1 and EV-2 go back to the external stowage platform to reinstall the multi-thermal insulation blanket over the stanchion. EV-2 takes his crew lock bag back to the airlock. EV-1 removes the foot restraint from the robotic arm and returns it to its original location. EV-1 goes starboard to pick up his and EV-2 safety tethers while EV-2 stows the three crew lock bags back inside the airlock. EV-1 returns to the airlock where both crew members ingress and conclude the EVA. Thank you all for your opening remarks. I'm going to turn it back over to Dina for some additional remarks. I just wanted to uh, add my thanks to the folks sitting next to me and their teams. Um, we have the flight operations teams uh, as well as the engineering teams and the avionics and software office of the ISS program who's really taken a lead on this uh, spacewalk. Uh, really, um, we, we'd like to give the teams a far out heads up uh, even do crew training before they leave if we can and um, that kind of thing. But in this case, it was a little bit faster turnaround. It wasn't a quick turnaround like as in doing an EVA the week after we declare it, but it, we did um, ask for a short turnaround and they've done a fantastic job. And so I just really wanted to give a shout out to them before we go on to the question and answers. All right, Leah, thank you very much. And we are now going to start the Q&A portion of the event. As a reminder, press star one if you have a question and star two to lower your hand if the question has already been asked. Please limit yourselves to one question and state your name and affiliation as well as to whom your question is addressed. We're gonna start here in the room. Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Sandy. Uh, I was interested in the number of foot restraints you have up there and the distance that astronauts are traveling to get to them. Like, do you have them stashed every certain hundred yards or something? How, how many foot restraints are up there and what's their importance? So the foot restraints are very important because uh, really you need a way to stabilize yourself during a spacewalk when you are trying to move around and manipulate hardware. This allows you to essentially use your feet to 
on a stabilized platform so you have forces that you can react against. Otherwise, for example, if you have a, a high setting on the pistol grip tool and you turn the bolt, instead of turning the bolt, you might end up turning yourself, for example. So we have four of these uh, foot restraints stationed on the seated cart, mostly uh, pre-positioned for uh, the critical contingency EVAs, and it's a nice place to have them. Uh, we do have a couple that are, are also scattered throughout, uh, but it is important for us to, to move those around as necessary. So in this case, rather than waiting until the summer EVAs to bring those out to that S6 work site, if we can bring them out early and pre-position them, that's one less thing that they have to do in the summer and they don't have to worry about them. All right, we will now move on to the phone bridge. Our first question is from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, this is a question for Dina. Um, Dina, with the VFS going off 39A on Wednesday, given the time needed to turn 39A around, is there any chance Acts 2 gets off before CRS 28? Or, I mean, does IROSA have priority? Can you maybe just talk about how things space out since all three of those guys are using the same pad? Thanks. Well, um, yeah, you're absolutely um, honing in on something here where we will be um, having to figure out a new launch date for Axiom based on the turnaround at the pad, uh, pad 39A. And so uh, we're working currently with, with Axiom and SpaceX on that potential launch date. Um, I think May 8th was the, was the previous date, and we're looking at what we could do at this point. Um, so again, um, it's, um, you know, we're trying to, if we can, leave uh, SpaceX CRS-28 on June 3rd, um, and th that sets us up for a uh, mission b up before the high beta that happens in July, and if we can complete that whole mission before that, uh, before that high beta, that would be preferred. Uh, we've got two SpaceX, uh, two spacewalks um, for the IROSA EVAs on that mission, and we'd like to do those and also allow for a contingency spacewalk before July 7th. Uh, and so the teams are right now, today, tomorrow, um, and we're uh, really this week trying to um, hone in on what is the potential launch dates for Axiom uh, while still trying to hold the CRS-28 dates as well. So uh, we're working that more to come the next day or two. Our next question on the line comes from Jeff Faust with Space News. Uh, good afternoon. A question for Dina. Um, curious if you have any updates from your Russian colleagues on the investigation into the leaks on both the Soyuz and Progress spacecraft, if there's any commonality between the two and how that might affect uh, space station operations. Thanks. Well, so we don't have any um, new news to report. Uh, they are continually um, investigating that. Um, we also have a, a, a team formed that um, is an investigative team as well to kind of look at that and what we can do in the near term to sor sort of help mitigate um, against that sort of risk. Um, the, the Soyuz that came home, they did take data on that Soyuz, temperature data. Uh, there were only three crew members inside, uh, and so, I mean, there were no crew members inside instead of three crew members, and so um, it doesn't paint a full picture, but they were able to take some data, and I know that they're looking into that. Um, there was uh, some thought that there was um, high, high temperatures on that Soyuz on return, but that is not what we heard from our Roscosmos colleagues. Um, so I, I don't um, think that we have a lot of um, detailed information that will be forthcoming, like a report or anything like that, uh, as far as we've heard from the Russians. But um, they are investigating, and we are working closely with them and on, on an investigative team. And, of course, we'll let you know when we have uh, mm -hmm. more information about it. Okay, we do have a question online. This one comes from Ivan. How long is the spacewalk on Friday planned to last? Six and a half hours. So uh, per our planning, uh, we're expecting a six hour and 30 minute EVA spacewalk. And we have another follow up on the line from Bill Harwood. Thanks, and this one's for, uh, for Scott or Sandy. Can, can, can you give us, like, an idea of how big the radio frequency group hardware is? I mean, is it like a, I don't know, a microwave, a mini refrigerator, or something that I can relate to? And does the, does the HGA, does the high-gain antenna stay outside, and it's just the support electronics that are coming in? I'm confused about what stays out and what comes home. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the radio frequency group hardware that's coming in is about 145 pounds. Um, I, for an estimate for the 
for the main box, I guess it's probably on the order of about three feet by one foot. Um, there is a high gain antenna attached to it that sticks out from the box. And then there's also a low gain antenna off to the side that, that sticks out a little less, but it is a pretty unwieldy box. It's not a nice uh, straightforward rectangle. It's, it's got these pieces off the side, which is one of the reasons we have to be very careful as we're bringing it back inside. It also doesn't fit very well on any of our existing ORU bags. So uh, that's why we're using the robotic arm to actually take it from the work site uh, into the airlock. Uh, otherwise, if we could put it in a nice bag and, and seal it up better, we would just bring it in uh, usually by the crew. Our next question comes from David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Yeah, I think we haven't checked in about the uh, IROSA panels. Uh, can you just give us an update? Are they performing at, above, or below? Uh, what's your sense of, of, of what these new panels are doing for station? Well, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I, I'll, then I'll hand it over to Scott, who monitors these things on a daily basis. But um, they're performing out, outstanding. They're doing really, um, really well. I'd say at or maybe even a little above um, their performance expectations at this point. Scott, did you want to add anything? Yeah, the, Dean, I, I completely agree. Uh, all of our experience with the IROSA panels have been uh, at least what we expected from them and actually a little bit more. We're very happy with the performance that we're, we're getting out of them, uh, and it's really helped our overall power situation on the space station. As the older solar arrays age, we're going to need this power uh, to keep up with the good science that we're doing. So uh, very happy with the, the performance that we're getting out of the, the iroses. All right, and I have a question while we wait to see if anyone else wants to uh, raise their hand on the line. For some of our viewers who might not be aware, can you describe the function of an S-band antenna? Um, well, sure. So um, we use this antenna to communicate through our TDRS satellites uh, and receive COM um, and data. So voice COM from the crew, for example, um, both down to the ground and also from the ground in mission control up to the crew, uh, as well as some data. Um, and this is um, uh, really the core systems data all comes down uh, on, this, on the S-band and allows the team on the ground to send up commands to the core systems as well. Uh, we additionally have a KU band system. Um, it has, uh, has a lot of functionality as well. Um, so it's not the sole source of our data and our communication, but um, it really was the original basis of all of our communications to and from the station. You want to add anything? I, I would just point out that really the S-band system is our critical uh, command and data link. The only thing that doesn't go through the S-band system is the video that you get to see. That is reliant on to the KU system. Um, so uh, even if the KU system goes down, we'd have everything we need to operate the vehicle uh, except for that video. So uh, it's a very critical uh, communication asset for the space station. All right, and we have a follow-up here in the room from Gina. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Dina. What's the current thinking on Frank Rubio's return? How long do you think he'll be there? When do you think he'll be coming home? Uh, well, um, he's, he's currently planned to come home on September 27th. Um, and so I believe, uh, but maybe somebody can help me, I think that's 371 days in space. And so that will be his, that will be the record that he'll be setting. Um, and so that we, nothing has changed on that. At, that. at this point, that's the latest Roscosmos date for that return vehicle. And we have a question on the line from Bill Harwood. Yeah, sorry, guys. I tried to squeeze this in last time. We got cut off. Uh, for, for, for Sandy, do, how big is the high-gain antenna? I'm just curious what the, what the size of that thing is on the side of the box. Thanks. That's it for me, I promise. <laughs> it's uh, actually got two posts that come out uh, off the, I'm going to call it the top of the RFG, uh, the radio frequency group. Uh, those posts uh, on one just terminates there, that's the, the gimbal motor, and then the other one has the high gain antenna itself out, which is a, a fairly broad cone. And I'm gonna estimate that's probably about 10 inches um, from one end to the other, and maybe about eight inches across in diameter. But I can get you better information than that. That's just my recollection. Okay. And we have another question from David Curley. Thank you. Like Harwood, I tried to follow up on the earlier one. It was about the iroses, and thank you for the information about how they're performing. Because they're covering the old, the legacy um, 
uh, panels. Are the legacy panels, you know, you had some calculations of what you thought you would get from them with the IROSAs on top of them. I'd also like to know how they're doing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I can take that one. So uh, just to give folks a background, so we still use the legacy panels that are behind the iroses. Uh, the parts that are not shadowed by the iroses still produce power. Um, it is uh, degraded over time, but we are still getting power that we expected out of them. Um, you know, the, one of the things we're worried about the, the arrays, not only is there a natural degradation over time, but they can be hit by micrometeoroids or something like that. So we have seen specific solar arrays um, sort of lose what we call strings or portions of that uh, because of damage that has happened to them. Uh, all the more reason to continue our upgrades over, over time. But uh, overall, the, the degraded portions of the old solar arrays are, are still working, uh, and we're still getting the power we expect at this age uh, that they are. So um, still good to have, uh, and we have not you know, had any complete failures of any solar arrays or anything like that, um, and we still plan to continue them, to use them as long as the, they'll work with us. Uh, I'll just add that um, one Bravo particularly um, has been one of these um, arrays that has had a little bit of damage, uh, at, we believe, um, based on the based on our imagery and then based on the telemetry that we have that shows uh, the power uh, output that it's uh, that's producing. And so uh, we did make a change to actually put an IROSA solar array over the top of this particular array uh, as one of the next sets uh, because of that very reason, um, knowing that we would cover up some portions of the arrays that we were not going to use. So, um, you know, as Scott said, some of this was predicted, and that's why we're doing the upgrades uh, and making sure that we're going to get the, the power in the system. But, um, you know, I think that this will be a great benefit on the One Bravo array particularly. Okay, and those are the questions we have for this afternoon. Again, you can tune into the Spacewalk Friday, April 28th. It'll begin our coverage at 6.45 a.m. Central Time with the Spacewalk itself planned to start at 8.15 a.m. Central. You can watch that on nasa.gov live, NASA TV, and the NASA app, and we will see you then. <laughs>